We greet you with the love of Jesus. It is good to be in the house of worship. To all of you who are present at online, we're just glad that you're here. Amen. There is a word from the Lord as we finish up our series on God and our emotions. If you have your Bibles, I need you to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 7 and when you find it let me know by saying amen 1 Corinthians the 13th chapter the 4th through the 7th verse when you find it let us reverence the word of God by standing because I believe in giving God all of the respect he is due. Have we all arrived at our scriptural destiny? Anybody still looking? In this familiar and famous passage of scripture, let us revisit these words. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Is that not what your Bible says? Yes. By the power of the Holy Spirit, from the aid of your prayers, for a few moments of your time, I want to talk about the image of love Amen. take your seats and pray with me for just a little while eternal God and our father our Lord and our Savior it is preaching time now and as always master we need the inspiration of your Holy Spirit father first and foremost I pray that Terrence grooms decrease that Jesus Christ might increase that your name be magnified your people be edified and then in some soul might be saved. Lord, I ask a fresh anointing on this earthen vessel that I might be cleansed from the innermost parts of my body to the outermost parts of my soul, that I am a clean conduit of your word, that your word will fall, flow through freely. I pray again that you bless your people, that your word will fall on fertile ground, that believers are made stronger and non-believers come into the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. I pray that you rebuke the adversary, Lord, that the church might accomplish great things in this season. Now, Holy Ghost, use me until you're through with me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The image of love. Whenever I do 
a premarital counseling, there are two questions that I start the session off with. And the first question I ask is, are you saved? Should have got more amens than that. Because truth be told, the most important question you will ever get in your life is, are you saved? The most important question that you will ever get is, where will you spend your eternity? The most important question that will transcend time and space, that will transcend humanity, is where you will spend your destiny and who you are in God. And I start off with that question because I am one that believes that if you cannot commit to God, how can you commit to a human? I am one that starts off with that question because if a person can't give themselves a wholeheartedly to the God that created them, to the God that sustains them, to the God that loves them unconditionally. How in the world do you expect them to commit to you? Uh, too many marriages go wrong because the Bible says be not unequally yoked believers with non-believers uh, and you wind up engaging yourself and being connected to somebody that don't walk with the God that you walk with uh, and then you wonder why you go through some of the hell that you go through. Uh, you need to understand that our spiritual connections are more important than our human human hookups. Uh, our spiritual connections uh, will take us to eternity or to hell. Uh, and so we need to understand that when we start to deal with our relationships, uh, I need to know if you walk with God or not. Right. Too often, we get caught up in the glitz and glamour. We get caught up in how they look and how they swoon. And we don't watch how they walk and who we walk with. And so I start off with the question, do you know the Lord or not? And can I get real in the house? I refuse to marry a couple if one is a believer and the other is a non-believer. Because the Bible said that is an orchestration that God did not ordain. But the second question I ask is just as important as the first question. The second question I ask is why do you want to marry this person? Because most of all, if you don't lay the right foundation, your marriage is doomed to start with. If you marry for all the wrong reasons, your marriage will not last long. Baby, you can marry for money, but money will run out. You can marry for beauty, but beauty fades. Unless you marry for the right reasons, your marriage is already on unsolid ground. And again, that's what happens in a lot of our culture. All too often, we marry for all the wrong reasons can I get real and personal in the house good because I'm going to get real anyway we messed up too many of our children because they got pregnant out of season uh, and then forced them to marry the wrong one. Uh, baby, a baby is not the reason why you get married. Uh, you're going to have to be with that child regardless. Uh, but don't connect yourself to somebody that you're not compatible with uh, just because you fell in a moment. Uh, you got to understand you got to marry for the right reason. I've seen folk marry for money only to get disappointed after they left the altar. So I ask the question all the time, why do you want to marry this person? And the question is always answered by most people. The reason why I marry them is because I love them. Now, I want you to understand that love is the only reason why you need to get married. But when I deal with that, I want to understand, do we really know what love looks like? Because when I look at the condition of marriage in America, it causes me to think that we don't know what love looks like. When I look at the fact that 50 50% of the marriages uh, that come together in America wind up in divorce. Uh, maybe we don't know what lo love looks like. Uh, in fact, 50, uh, 60, and 70% uh, of second marriages uh, wind up in divorce. Uh, maybe we don't know what love looks like. Uh, and if I take it a little further, uh, I want you to understand uh, that the average marriage in America only lasts seven or eight years. Uh, that's why I applaud the people that married in their 20s. Uh, they're married for 30 years. Uh, they're married for 40 and 50 years because oftentimes our marriages dissolve because we don't know what love looks like. We say, I love them. But yet when the rubber meets the road, you go your way and I go mine. We say, I love them. But when the storms of life start to rage, you get your umbrella and I get mine. We say I love them, uh, but when thick and thin and mud and murky water, when things get thick, they thin out. We don't know what love looks like. And maybe we don't know what love looks like because we have the wrong image of love. Can I work with that just a little bit? 
because there was a song written by Foreigner back in 1999 which posed the question, I want to know what love is. And truth be told, the world is still asking that question. Regardless of how sinful mankind has been, they still want to know what love is. Regardless of the conditions that people are going through, they still want to know what love is. Regardless of what's transpiring in our society, somebody's still looking for somebody else to tell me what love is. And can I preach the way I feel? We who are in the church, we ought to be examples of God's love. We who have been blood-bought and born again ought to be able to show the world what love looks like. We who've been washed from all of our transgressions ought to remind the world that love looks differently than you think. The world is asking what love is because the world has the wrong image of love. Can I press my claim a little bit further? Because when you start to Google the image of love, uh, there are several images that will come out. Uh, one of the images that came out that I took notice of uh, was a picture of a man and a woman walking together in romance. Uh, can I say that again? Uh, it was a man and a woman, uh, not a man and a man. That's not God's love. Uh, not a woman and a woman. That's not God's love. Uh, God ordained for a man and woman to come together in holy matrimony to express and experience uh, the love that God has for humanity. That's one symbol of love. But in the midst of all of that, why does love not last? Another symbol of love is this geometric shape of a heart uh, that makes it look like this is an expression uh, of roses and butterflies, uh, flowers and candy. Uh, but I stop by to remind you that love is deeper than that. Uh, because baby, if you base your love on your feelings, uh, when your feelings change, your love will change. Uh, when your money runs out, uh, your love might fade. Uh, when the beauty falls by the light wayside, uh, your love might fade. Uh, we got to understand love is deeper than our feelings. Can I preach it the way I feel? Because uh, if all we did was love based on our feelings. Uh, the devil will manipulate your feelings uh, and steal the love you have inside. Uh, love's got to be deep within how I feel. Uh, love is a principle on how I live. Love, love goes beyond what I feel. And love moves into what I know. Google the image of love. And oftentimes you see uh, this famous picture of Cupid. Uh, but when you deal with the history of Cupid, uh, you'll find out that that's a very poor image of love. Uh, Cupid is the Roman god, uh, which is already in paganism, uh, a god of erosity, uh, a god of satisfying uh, your sexual pleasures. Uh, and that's the problem with some of us. Uh, we base our love on our loins. Uh, and baby, sooner or later, uh, your loins will fail. But where will your love be? Uh, and can I preach the way I feel? Uh, what we don't understand is Cupid has an evil twin. Uh, and while one twin shoots an arrow love, the other twin shoots an arrow hate. And so if you allow the world to orchestrate what love looks like to you, the world will manipulate who you are. We got to know what love looks like. And as I deal with handling our emotions, not only do we need to learn how to navigate the negative emotions, we got to learn how to live right in the positive emotions. If you don't learn to live right in your love, you're going to abuse the people that you love. Oftentimes because we love wrong, uh, we treat people wrong. Uh, oftentimes because we mishandle love, uh, we mishandle the relationships that we have. Uh, oftentimes because we don't understand love. Uh, we don't understand how we are supposed to walk with mankind. Uh, but I'm so glad uh, on this Sunday morning, uh, the Holy Ghost wants to show you uh, what love looks like. Uh, can I work the text just a little bit? You see, Paul had to deal with this church at Corinth uh, that was gifted and talented, uh, but they were missing some things. Uh, and one of the things that they were missing uh, is they were missing what love looks like. Uh, and so Paul had to remind them uh, that, baby, if you're going to exercise your gift, uh, you got to exercise it in love. Uh, so I want to tell you this Sunday morning, uh, when I deal with love, uh, there are three things I want to point out. Uh, the first thing I want to point out uh, is if you're going to love, you have to have the right foundation. All too often, we don't have the right foundation of love. Ask somebody why you love them. They'll say, I love them because they treat me right. I love them because they bring me gifts. 
I love them because they picked me up out of the dirt. Uh, I love them because they love, they love me first. Uh, and I want you to understand that is human sensibility. Uh, we are carnal and selfish creatures. Uh, and it's always all about us. Uh, but baby, that's the wrong ideology of love. Uh, I don't love somebody because of what they've done for me. Because uh, if you stop doing for me, that means I'm going to stop loving you. Uh, amen. Life in the house. Uh, that's how some of us are. We have loved as long as you did right by me. Uh, but what if I can't do what I used to do? Uh, what if I can't go where I used to go? Uh, what if my legs fall feeble? Uh, will you still love me? Uh, we got to learn to love under the right foundation. Well, grooms, what's the right foundation? I want to take you to a place of parenthood. Oftentimes, when a parent experienced their childbirth and they look at this baby that hasn't been able to do anything for them, they look at this baby that can't even bring a drink of water. They look at this baby who's never washed the dish or cut the grass. Uh, they look at this baby uh, who hasn't been able to go to school to bring grades. Uh, yet they look at this baby uh, and they love that baby with their whole heart. Uh, and the reason why they love that baby uh, is just because that baby exists. Uh, I stopped by to tell you uh, the only reason you need to love somebody uh, is just because they exist. Uh, if God placed them in your circle, uh, God wants you to love them. Uh, don't love them because they're good. Uh, love them because they are there. God said, I loved you just because you are here. Why do we love somebody just because they are? You want to love like God loves? Baby, you got to love somebody. Not because they did, but because they are. So how do we love? We got to have the right foundation. But not only do we have the right foundation, baby, you got to have the right action. And that's where we mess up with our identity with love. We don't lo know what love looks like. And so we don't know the actions of love. In this particular chapter, uh, Paul begins to deal with what the actions of love really look like. Uh, let me walk through a few verses before I close it out like this. Uh, we need to understand that Paul says, if you want to know what love looks like, uh, first of all, charity suffers long. Uh, in other words, love is patient. Uh, can I preach it the way I feel? Uh, there is an old song that we used to sing when I was a child uh, that says, please be patient with me because uh, God is not through with me yet. Uh, but when God gets through with me, uh, then I shall come come forth as pure gold. We got to understand that if we love somebody, we got to be patient with them. They got to grow up just like we had to grow up. They going to make some mistakes just like we made some mistakes. But because I know what God can do with you and time, I'm going to let God work on your life. If I love you, I'm going to be patient with you. Not only am I going to be patient, but I'm going to be kind to you. Oftentimes, one of the problems that we have in the church is we have forgotten what kindness looks like. We think that every now and again, I can only be kind to folk uh, that's going to be kind to me. Uh, I'm only going to be nice to folk uh, that's nice to me. Uh, I'm only going to speak to folk uh, that speak to me. Uh, but I'm so glad that God did not treat me like that because uh, when I was not treating God well, God was still kind to me. Uh, when I wasn't giving God my praise, he still woke me up every morning. Uh, when I refused to lift up my holy hands, uh, he still put breath in my body. Uh, why was he doing that? Because God loved me anyhow. I stopped by to tell you this Sunday morning, if you love somebody, you're going to be kind to them no matter what they did to you. Y'all might have argued last night, but baby, I'm going to fix your breakfast in the morning. We might not have agreed on the way to church, but we're going to forget it and give God our best praise. I love you enough to be kind to you. Love. Envy it not because I love my neighbor. I celebrate my neighbor's accomplishments. The Bible reminds us, cover not your neighbor's ox, nor his ass, nor his home, and other whatever the Lord that blessed your neighbor with. Uh, don't want what he got. Uh, you just give God praise. Uh, I stop by to remind you uh, for what love really looks like uh, is when I see God bless you with a car, I'm shouting with you in your car. Uh, and the reason why I'm shouting uh, is because the same God that blesses you uh, is the same God that can bless me. Uh, and baby, you might need that car. I might be all right with what I have. Uh, I got to learn to love you enough uh, to appreciate your elevation. Uh, I'm not going to get mad at you because uh, you got a new promotion. Uh, I'm going to give God praise. Uh, I love you enough uh, that I want to see you do well. 
love vaunted not itself is not puffed up let me give you the Terrence Grooms version love ain't about you it's about the other person one of the problems that we have uh, is we love people based on how they treat us. Uh, we love people based on how uh, they deal with us. Uh, in other words, our love is not really about you. Uh, it's all about us. Uh, but when I look at the scripture, uh, the scripture reminds me uh, that my love can't be about me. Because uh, when I look at me, uh, I'm a wretch and feeble. Uh, when I look at me, uh, I'm toe up from the flow up. Uh, when I look at me, uh, I'm a mess to start with. Uh, but I can love you uh, for who you are. And so because I love you I will lift you up because I love you I will elevate you because I love you I'll help you get to where God wants you to go what are the actions of love love is patient love is kind love lifts up his brother love does not behave itself unseemly sinketh not her own is not easily provoked and thinketh no evil. In other words, love acts right. One of the reasons why I do my best to live holy is because I know you're watching my life and I love you enough not to be a stumbling block in your life. Love causes you to act right. Uh, the song by Whitney Houston said, love should have brought you home last night. Uh, a lot of our husbands need to learn from that song. Uh, if I love my wife, uh, I'm not going to Sally, I'm going home. Uh, if I love my wife, uh, I'm not going to the pool hall, I'm going home. Uh, if I love my wife, uh, I'm not going to the strip club, I'm going home. Uh, and can I preach it the way I feel? Uh, it ain't just about the men. Uh, some of you women uh, need to take your butt home. Love causes me to act right. I love you enough not to be a stumbling block. Love is not easily provoked. Sister Grooms and I have been married for over 19 years, well, almost 19 years. It'll be 19 in March. But the thing that I want to share with you is that we don't always agree. We don't always see eye to eye. Now, it's rare that we have cross words, but I know Terrence Grooms, and I know the triggers in Terrence Grooms, and I want you to understand what love looks like to me, because I recognize that I can fly off the handle, and so when I feel my pressure boiling, I have to remove myself from the situation, because I love her enough not to expose her to the worst parts of me. I love her enough not to expose her to my anger. I love her enough not to expose her to my temper. Love will cause you to walk away sometimes I don't know who I'm preaching to this Sunday morning but if you love your wife don't put your hands on her like that love is not easily provoked love rejoices not in iniquity but rejoices in truth in other words, because I love you, I'm not happy when you stumble. I'm happy when you get up. I'm not happy when you fall in the mud. I'm happy when you've been washed off. Can, can, I, can I get real in the house? All of us have had some stumbling blocks. Uh, all of us have fallen in the mud. Uh, all of us have slipped up and messed up sometimes. Uh, baby, I don't want to see you fall. Uh, and I don't care how many times you fall. But every time you get up, uh, I'm going to praise God for your stance. Uh, every time you get up, uh, I'm going to praise God for your cleansing. Uh, every time you get up, uh, I'm going to praise God for your elevation. Uh, and the reason why I praise uh, is because I love you. Uh, and I want to see you uh, be with the king. You got to have the right actions to love. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. I'm going to let God in time deal with you to bring out the best in you. And I'm not going to deal with your bad past. I'm going to deal with your blessed future. When I look at you, I don't just see what you used to be. I see what God can turn you into. I don't see where you used to be. I see where God is taking you because I love you. I see the best that God has for you. If we're going to love, you got to have the right foundation. Love them because they exist. If you're going to love, 
You got to have the right actions. Let this scripture be your guide. But herein lies the crux of this sermon. If you're going to love, you got to have the right image. I stopped by to remind you that we don't know what love looks like because we've allowed the world to paint the image. Can I remind you this Sunday morning that love does not look like Cupid's arrow. Love does not look like this little heart-shaped diagram. Love does not look like a man and woman walking together. Does not look like lilies in the field and flowers all over the place? Love does not look like a beautiful sunrise nor a beautiful sunset. No, love has a very different look to it. Grooms, what does love look like? Church, I'm glad you asked. Because when I stop by the book of Romans uh, and I look at chapter 5 uh, around verse 8, uh, I discover what love looked like. Uh, the Bible reminds us uh, that God commended his love toward us, uh, that while we were yet sinners, uh, Christ died for us. Uh, what does love look like? Uh, love looks like Calvary's mountain. Uh, what does love look like? Uh, love looks like that old rugged cross. Uh, what does love look like? Uh, love looks like that crown of thorns. Uh, what does love look like? Uh, love looks like Jesus. Jesus, uh, that stretched his arms out wide. Uh, love looks like Jesus uh, that was pierced in his side. Uh, love looks like Jesus uh, that died on the cross for our sins. Uh, what does love look like? Uh, love looks like Calvary. Love is not activated at our best. Love was activated at our worst. You see, we want to express our love when people are doing good. We want to express our love uh, when people are on the up and up. Uh, we want to express our love uh, when everything was going well. Uh, but when I go back to Romans uh, and I see when God expressed his love, uh, he didn't wait till my Sunday morning. Uh, he didn't wait till I had my suit on. Uh, he didn't wait till after I got cleaned up. Uh, when he saw me down in the mess, uh, that's when he loved me. Uh, when he saw me covered in sin, uh, that's when he loved me. Uh, when he saw me covered in mud, uh, that's when he loved me. Uh, I'm so glad I found love in Jesus I've got two questions question number one will you love people the way God wants you to will you love people the way God instructs you to question number two have you found God's love yourself can I get real in the house I'm not asking, did you join anybody's church? A whole lot of people have joined the church. Hadn't found God's love. I'm not asking, are you a good person? A whole lot of people are good people. Haven't found God's love. I'm not asking about your educational background, your money background, your social economics. I know all of that is good. But the only way you find God's love is that if you allow him to be your personal savior and transformer, Love is best when it's reciprocated. Let me give you a freebie. God loves you anyhow. The world may not tell you that. Your family may not tell you that. But I'm telling you right now, God loves you. But the question is, will you receive God's love? Too many people are walking around, haven't received the love of God because they think that they are unlovable. But if God can forgive me for the things that I've done and love me in spite of who I used to be, then God can certainly love you.